The expectation is for regular council meetings that we'll be doing a hybrid uh, type model where it's in person but also available online based on all the positive feedback we got with the, uh, with the online meeting since uh, the pandemic began. Uh, we'll get right into the recording of attendance. I note that all members of council are here with the exception of Councillor Neal. I want to say welcome to uh, everybody that is here uh, and want to recognize that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Pescatu Mogadi people. Qantas Cook is comprised in part of St. Andrews, where we stand today in New Brunswick. It is under the umbrella of the unceded traditional territory of the Wolstaqui and the Mi'kmaq people. I'll be looking for a mover uh, to approve the agenda as circulated. Okay, I've got uh, moved by Councillor Blanchard and seconded by Councillor Heenan. Any changes to today's, uh, to this evening's agenda? Seeing none, so I will call the question. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please uh, signify by saying aye. Okay, that is everybody that has been carried. A disclosure of conflict of interest. Does anyone have any at this time that they'd like to disclose? Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to declare, declare conflict on PED 220305. Perfect, so I'll look for you at that time uh, just to recuse yourself and step in the uh, judges' chambers and uh, we'll give you a moment to do so then. Thank you very much, Councilor Grumichel. One more check, anyone else? All right, so we'll keep moving along. Uh, we do, uh, we're jumping into presentations. We have two this evening. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Matt McKenna with us. He is an investment advisory, advisory for Scotia Wealth and he's doing a presentation on the town trust and reserve funds for council. This is a annual presentation that we do uh, and uh, we're really glad to be able to do it in person and have you. So uh, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Your Worship, thank you very much for giving us a few moments. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to say after two and a half years, this is my first in-person meeting in the entire province. So we're quite happy about it. Um, I was quite happy when Chris said that uh, we could come down live and in person. I'm tired of Zoom. <laughs> um, we, we've put together a very brief agenda. I just wanted to kind of bring you through our team experience. I've asked one of my colleagues, Mitch McLeod, to come and just go through a little bit of our team because there's some new members to the council from the last time that we've done this presentation. And then I'm gonna take a, a moment to talk about risk management and the investment policy statement, what that does uh, for the uh, fund and for the council and for the uh, city members. We'll show you a sample report card and then we're gonna give you a brief update on where the fund actually sits and how it's actually performed. Uh, with that, I'd like to call up Mitch to just give a brief overview of our team. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, Quick update, I suppose, on the McKenna Group now. Uh, since the last time that we would have been down, the team has actually grown quite a bit, um, and we're quite proud of the team experience that we do bring. Uh, last time there was three individuals on the team, and now we're up to six so far. Um, our clients really enjoy having that many different people that you're able to reach out to and talk to uh, and bring that different team experience to the individuals. The typical um, type of client that we look for, I suppose, we would deal with a lot of professionals and business owners and then a lot of boards such as this or foundations. Uh, we bring a lot of a uh, highly disciplined process. Um, you'll see that in the investment policy statement. You'll see that in the report card that we bring up afterwards. Uh, but whether they are professionals or whether it is business owners or boards, everybody needs to have that discipline and process. And that's something that our team really does and uh, brings forward. Um, we have regular meetings between the six of us, so everybody's contributing, whether that be on the investment side of things, the process side of things, uh, how we bring together investment policy statements, and really what we want to do is uh, lower everybody's amount of risk that you're able to take. Um, and so that's a bit of a brief update on the team and the process that we put forward right now. So one of the things that uh, Mitch didn't mention about the team that's, that's a part of the overall process is having multiple people involved with your account actually lowers your risk because if there's a sudden event with me, a departure or whatnot, the, the fund as a whole is not left in lurch with other people not knowing what's going on. So as part of our overall process, we have multiple people on our team involved in it. Uh, the discipline that we bring to the table that is something that Chris and I would have started a few years ago. Um, was with respect to actually the implementation of investment policy statement. An investment policy statement is, defines how the fund is managed, uh, how it manages risk, what is it allowed to do, what is it not allowed to do. 
within that process, we built that off of best practice. So we would have used like things like the Toronto Foundation to say, what are they using for best practices within the investment policy statement? What that does is it guides the decisions I'm allowed to make, the advice that I have to give Chris and the investment committee, but it also defines the reporting structure. Uh, you're going to see that we have a report card within the process. It demonstrates where we have a definitive sign-off. So this is not like an audit of financial statement where we're looking back and we're certifying. We're certifying every quarter that we're meeting and in compliance with the investment policy statement. Uh, and clearly, one of the things that we're managing within that is the actual rate of return. So again, we're, we're trying to manage that rate of return within the framework. Uh, how we define that uh, risk management is with asset allocation. So for people that aren't familiar uh, with that process, it's how much do we allocate to cash, how much do we allocate to bonds, and how much do we allocate to equities. That's how we manage global risk. And then within that, how much do we allocate to one individual investment? So I'm going to give an example. The investment policy statement limits how much money we can put into any single entity. So whether that's Scotiabank shares, a Scotiabank GIC, we have an absolute maximum that we're allowed to place within any one of those investments. Um, that's, again, manages risk. So if something was to happen to that, uh, that investment, it doesn't necessarily jeopardize the whole fund. So this is the whole function of the investment policy statement. Um, at any point, if people have questions, feel free, to, feel free to ask them. I'm going to bring Mitch back up. He's going to run you through the last sample report card. Uh, I just gave Chris the, the new report card for this quarter. Uh, we'll finish after he gives you a sample of the level of detail that we go through in terms of our sign-off process every quarter. And then I'm going to give you a snapshot of where the existing quarter, uh, quarter sits. Yeah, so as Matt said, it's very important to A, bring the, have an investment policy statement that works and works exactly how you guys want to have it. Um, the difference and one of the main things that we like to do is then follow up on it. So on a quarterly basis, how do we do that? We created a uh, report card. And so within that report card, um, to Matt's point earlier, if we have a certain allocation of cash, a certain allocation to preferred shares, a certain allocation to uh, bonds and equities, uh, we need to make sure that we're within those allocations. And the way that we do that is to follow up on it with a report card on a quarterly basis. Um, to give you an example, over the last couple of years, equities have significantly outperformed what would be cash or fixed income. And if you do that, and if you just kind of let it go to what it was a year ago or a quarter ago or two quarters ago, that could be thrown out of allocation. So um, what we do is follow up on it to make sure that if equities get a little bit too high, then maybe we sell that back down again and maintain the discipline and maintain the risk management. Um, so keeping that, uh, keeping that in mind, what this does is it keeps everybody on track um, and it significantly lowers risk by being able to do it and stay on top of it this way. Did you have any questions at all on kind of what that sample report card may look like? Uh, uh, just a quick one, I guess. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we meet with you kind of annually to go through this. Uh, it might be more a question for you, uh, Mr. Spear, but when you get a quarterly report card, do you guys kind of do this uh, like a quarterly meeting or is this just if you see something then you request it? What does that look like from a staffing perspective? From a staffing perspective, we make sure to get together every quarter okay. uh, just to make sure everyone's having that hard look at it. And frankly, even the, the social wealth when they're making investments on our behalf, they still call me and, and basically ask my permission to make to, to assure that these things are falling within the investment policy, explaining why it has to be done, and then following through. So sometimes we talk each, to each other monthly as transactions occur, but then we do a deep delve analysis every quarter. Thank you. Any other member of council have a question at this point? I think we're good to continue. Okay. Perfect, thank you. That's everything on the investment policy statement and kind of the report card and how we follow up with it um, and how we keep that discipline process. So thanks for your time. So the, uh, the, most recent, uh, the most recent numbers, again, that I just gave to Chris, the investment policy statement has a target rolling rate of return that it wants to, to achieve, which is, means you guys are uh, meeting your objectives within the asset allocation framework. And uh, as of... Uh, Market close for March 15th, 2022. Uh, the range, uh, target range is somewhere between 4 and 5% after investment fees. 
you guys are compounding at 4.87% after fees at that, at that point in time. Um, uh, that's a very uh, solid function of the asset allocation. I, we, are, we knowingly are taking less risk by buying bonds and fixed incomes, but we also know the offset of that is we have lower rates returns on those, but when we combine those with the equity sleeve of the portfolio, that's how we're getting a compounding return much greater than a GSC, much greater than leaving in a bank account, and much greater than a bond as, as a whole. Uh, to give you an idea where the diversification works for your account, uh, this year, as of the same reporting period, the U.S. market was down around 12%, the Canadian market was down 1%, your account's up 1%, roughly, at the same point in time. Within that same framework, we're uh, definitively on target. So. Uh, we have a minimum uh, range of fixed income of 30%, so the fund can never have less than 30% fixed income into it. We're right now at about 39. Uh, equities, it can't, uh, it has to be somewhere between 20 and 60% equities, we're about 46%. And we are carrying a slightly larger cash balance right now. Uh, recently, the uh, council transferred some money into the funds, and I know that you're going through your process of your capital budgeting and, and whatnot, and at some point, I would expect Chris and I are gonna get together to decide um, how much of that cash is needed or not needed, and if it's not needed, then we can then deploy it within the portfolio. But up to this point, we've been holding that aside, uh, waiting direction from, uh, from the municipality. Uh, within the actual same portfolio, again, you have no single investment that's greater than 10%. You have no single equity investment greater than 5%. So if you think of Scotia Bank shares, Royal Bank shares, uh, Microsoft, none of those investments alone or greater than 5% of the total fund, again, so it's managing the risk uh, from a diversification perspective. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it, it's obviously safe to assume when you're going 4 to 5% because it's uh, essentially taxpayers' dollars were more conservative than personal investments, but I will say my own personal invest investments in the first quarter hasn't been 4.87%, so that's, that's good <laughs> news for the town. Um, obviously, obviously, as such, like, uh, if you look at the way that the, the world is, especially right now with, with things that are happening internationally, uh, you know, the fact that we have a, a larger percentage than probably a, a lot of people would when you get into cash and fixed income and preferred shares. I, what's happening in the world right now, I, I, I feel pretty, uh, pretty confident that we're <laughs> diversifying it the way we are is definitely the right call because uh, at the end of the day, um, you get surprises in the market and, and not having 5%, for example, in any equity, that just makes complete sense. Uh, as much as we'd all like 20% return and say you ever did come and do the presentation and got it, we wouldn't be upset, but I understand yeah. why we're diversifying. It makes complete sense. Any questions from any member of council now that they've seen all this, the uh, actual report cards? Uh, Makes sense. We have someone with some knowledge on the subject. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Hurdle, go ahead. Well, actually, I'm not sure if this is, you guys hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your whole question. Yeah, so if you compare the common emergency and say energy, okay, yeah. some portion of the funds will be better using oil and gas industry. I'm just curious to know, knowing about our common emergency, how it's going to be all your investment in the fund. Yeah, so uh, within the whole fund itself, we are very focused on ESG. Um, the challenge that we've had over the last, uh, I'll call it, number of years is people have only focused on the E within the ESG. Uh, we're seeing right now in, in uh, uh, Europe, where not focusing on the social or the governance piece has come back to, um, to damage those economies. So we don't have direct investments in upstream oil and gas. We do have investments within transportation, within the gas sector. Um, it's our belief that uh, those investments are among the highest rated on the ESG side, still participating in that. Also, we are managing and, and watching with those pipelines, basically is what we're investing in, uh, how they're handling their environmental footprint with either credit offsets or investments for uh, alternative energy in the future. But it's our view right now in the world that oil's here, we're mindful of that, but we'll also want to participate in the most environmentally friendly way we can, and we feel we're doing that now with, with the pipeline investments we have. Yeah. Good, good question and great answer. Um, any other member of council? 
All right, well, uh, I should ask as well, Mr. Spear, uh, you live this day today. any questions from you as well? Well, I just want to point out a couple of things. That is within the investment policy, the equities are always based on a certain bond rate or a certain rating. And maybe Matt can just yeah. touch on that really quick as how we determine if uh, equity falls within our range. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so within the investment policy statement, we have a credit worthiness uh, criteria for both bonds and fixed income elements. Uh, they have to be investment grade rated. Uh, and if it falls under investment grade rating, we have uh, not a, in the policy an immediate trigger to sell, but we have an immediate need to call and, and consult. Um, often when, in our business, it's called a fallen angel. So a company gets into a little bit of trouble, the credit people get a little nervous, they downgrade the company. Um, if we don't have that ability to actually have a call, we may be forced to sell. Uh, right now, we're not forced to sell, but we would require an immediate call to Chris to say, we want to continue to hold although it's been downgraded, um, uh, we don't think there's a great risk or it's maturing soon enough that we don't want to actually sell and take that loss. Now we'd rather just hold it. Uh, but it's safe to say that our credit on, on our portfolio is maintained at a much higher grade than even triple B, which is still considered investment grade. We're much more up to the upper end because we don't, you know, we're not buying fixed income to make a lot of money. We're buying fixed income for the safety within the portfolio. That's the same thing on the on the uh, equity side. If we had one of our equity investments that had a significant credit downgrade within the policy, we'd be examining: Do we still want to maintain equity exposure to a company that just got downgraded? Yeah, it should be noted too when we have corrections in the market. Our, although our returns aren't um, as high as, say, if you had personal investments in RSPs, honestly, but that's due to the risk that the town should only put itself up to. At the same time, when we see corrections, you don't tend to see that bottoming out. We're just kind of flat the whole way through. Yeah. And um, although he's got the five year, which is the best measurement, I th I'm trying to remember, I think it was over 10% last year, like oh, yeah. January to- Yeah, so la last fiscal season, which was last year, uh, combined after fees, the fund did 15.3%. Uh, uh, Relative to the equity indexes, uh, New York did 27 and a half and Toronto did 23 and a half. So you're carrying less than uh, less risk, but still a great return. So last year was one of your best years from return perspective. Uh, two years ago, the markets did the same kind of returns and you were around 10. We've been working over the last couple of years with Chris to implement more diversification and more, more uh, selection on the security side. Perfect. Okay. You're good. Uh, you're, with your background, uh, you sure you don't have other questions? I know the stuff excites you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, maybe you guys can meet after, right? So thank you very much for coming down and joining us. It is good to have a presentation in person. Uh, so we really appreciate you uh, commuting down here. And uh, based on uh, the quarter report, just keep up the great work. When, when, when it actually says between 4 and 5% and we're in the high end of towards 5%, that's exactly where we should be with based on the path we wanted to. So thank you very much. Thanks. Feel, feel free to stay stay around for the next three hours for some entertainment. But <laughs> so we're going to transition at this point. We have a second presentation. He's your worship, just one second, yep. Council. As a reminder, please turn on your microphones when you are speaking. We cannot hear you. Push it. Okay. Push it. All right, we're just gonna take a, just a brief recess, a two minute recess council, just to make sure everyone's mic's working and we'll ask the public just to bear with us. Testing. Testing, can you hear me? I didn't press my button, I apologize. Yeah. I'm good. Okay. You want me to push? Test one, test, test, test. test. Be loud. Mine's not very loud. Yep. Yes. Do up. For go. Do up. Yeah, there green go. for go. But mine isn't very loud, Mr. Knopper. Maybe you don't want to hear me. <laughs> yes. Sir. Green light. All right, we'll uh, get okay. back underway. Uh, at this time, uh, joining us virtually is uh, Mr. Govan, who is the senior planner. 
He's doing the public presentation on amendment MP 20-05 to the municipal plan MP 20-01 for rezoning of 258 Montague Street, which is PED 220303. Uh, I can see him on our screen. Welcome, Xander, good to see you. Can't hear you quite yet, give us just a moment. If you can hear us, Sandra, sing a song or something so we know when we pick you up. If you're sitting there silent, we won't know when we got you. Xander, if you can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up? Xander, can you hear me? So yes, he, he, he He can't hear us. If we can't, if we can't get him, we'll get uh, Councillor Gumashell to do the presentation this evening. Sander, say something. Xander, we're going to start, just hold by Paul and, um, and Pat are going to work on it, but your worship, maybe start moving through the rest of the agenda slowly while they work out the technical details so it doesn't hold us up for long. All right, I'll just, uh, just get a quick council consensus. Everyone good if we just rearrange the agenda? We won't make a formal motion. Everyone good to continue and then we'll come back to the presentation? Yes. yes. All right. All right, so uh, we're going to uh, come back uh, to uh, the presentation from uh, Mr. Gopin. Uh, we will be approving the minutes the next meeting. There's no communications or staff report this evening, so we're getting right into the introduction, consideration, and passing of bylaws. And the first one up would be Finance and Administration with the Deputy Mayor Kate Akaji. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the first one is, or the only one I have, is FA220307. And it's the bylaw number 22-02, a bylaw to regulate the code of conduct of the Council of the S Town of St. Andrews first reading. And the background is this. A code of conduct bylaw establishes expectations for how council members should conduct themselves while carrying out their responsibilities and in their work as a collective decision-making body for the community. It is prudent for each council to review their code of conduct bylaw and identify changes accordingly. Bylaw number 19-11, a bylaw to regulate the code of conduct of the Council of St. Andrews, of the Town of St. Andrews. In addition, with local governance reform moving forward, it is advised that council review. Provided with this report is a draft version of bylaw number 22-02 to replace the existing bylaw of 19-11. Suggested changes to the code of conduct include 
A as, or dash statement of values and principles, enhanced behaviors of council, respect for decision making process, and adhere to the policies and procedures, an enhanced use of the communication tools and social media, a conflict of interest and confidential information, compliance with bylaw and corrective actions. So the motion is this, that council grants leave for first reading to the bylaw number 22-02, a bylaw to regulate the code of conduct of the Council of the Town of St. Andrews. And I so move this, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. A seconder? At Councillor Hurdle. And we'll open this one up for discussion. Seeing none, so I will call the question. All those in favor of going to first reading, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That is everybody, so that has been carried. Thank you very much, Council. So I will read it by title. Um, this is bylaw number 22-02. It's a bylaw to regulate the code of conduct of the Council in the Town of St. Andrews. So one is short title, two is purpose and application, three is definitions, four is statutory framework and interpretation, five is statement of values and principle of members, six is Council responsibilities, Seven is behavior of, uh, or members of council. Eight is respect for decision-making process. Nine is adherence to policies, procedures, and bylaws. 10 is orientation and training attendance. 11 is conduct respecting administration. Number 12 is gifts and benefits. 13 is the use of local government property, resources, and services by members of council. 14 is election campaign. 15 is use of communication tools and social media. 16 is confidential information. 17 is conflict of interest. 18 is government relationships. 19 is business relationships. 20 is improper use of influence. Number 21 is compliance with this bylaw. And 22 is repeal and effective date. So this was uh, read for the first time on Monday, uh, March 21st, 2022. Um, so thank you for that one. Uh, and uh, I know it's just first reading, but uh, kudos to council for uh, increasing, um, I guess you could say the, uh, the bylaw um, to hold yourself even more accountable. I think that that's, uh, this isn't something that you had to do, but the fact that you went out of the way to, uh, to tighten that up, it speaks volumes to, uh, to the willingness of everybody to want to op uh, operate in, in the appropriate manner. So thank you very much, Council. We're switching to uh, Public Works, which is Councillor Blanchard. Thank you, Worship. I think, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Worship, we're willing to try for Willing to try. Yeah, we would yep. have to get into it before number six. So sorry to interrupt. Are you okay, Councillor Blanchard? Just holding off for now. So we'll see if we have uh, Mr. Gopin joining us now. Sander, talk through your phone. So we'll come back to this one. <laughs> Keep trying. <laughs> um, so we will go uh, now to Councillor Blanchard. Thank you, Councillor Blanchard. That's, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just want to confirm, Councillor, or sorry, Your Worship. Um, f I've got two, uh, two motion or two on the agenda here. One re refers to the, uh, I guess it's more of a report from from staff on uh, thank you. I should, have, I should have pulled that away for sure. Um, okay. So at this point, we will have a conversation about Katie's Cove Water Main, which is the installation extension request. Uh, it's under PW 220305, and uh, on page uh, 20, there is a staff report. So I don't know if Mr. Knopper or Mr. Spear will be commenting on council at this. I think by default, it might be Mr. Spear right now. <laughs> That's right. Oops. It's a good thing I read the council package, Your Worship. No, I'm just kidding. So, so Your Worship, there's been a request from Katie's Cove, Inc. Uh, to help uh, move along their needs down there for public washrooms. And so the president, uh, Guy Grew, has said they've raised $80,000 towards the construction of washrooms themselves, but they need to run a service line, um, a proper service line, that's gonna cost around um, $425,000 in order to service uh, the washrooms. Um, within that, he's asking if we consider it under the trail funding, but as alternative source, we also have um, the TAUB funding, you know, from last year. Uh, within it, 
we'd have to ask the funding partners, it would be a, a change in scope if, we, if council's interested in doing this to make sure they're willing to do it. Um, there's also a bit of a concern by staff is that it's not public property as you know there. Currently it's privately owned by, by, by landowner, the hotel to be specific, everybody would know. And Katie's Cove Inc. does have a 25 year lease arrangement, but a water line has a 100 year life. And so both council has to take that into consideration and I'm sure the funding par partners would. Uh, we had a similar request on another project a couple of years ago and they have concerns if you're increasing the value of privately held land. So those are kind of the struggles. But again, Katie's Cove Inc. Has, has put together funding and has tried to work hard to bring up the Cove to back to its glory days, if you will, back when it was first developed in the you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, when you heard about the Hawaiian nights and the big crowds at the beaches. And they have a long plan. Um, they've run into some difficulties with fundraising because um, of the nature of their application, they aren't able to get a charitable status because they don't own the land. So that's made it hard for them to access some funds through other charities and things that we only give to charities. And so they're asking for council's consideration to help support this so they can sort of start the, I guess the first phase of the buildings. They have been doing work on the property and cleaning up the land and the beach and stuff. So I won't say they haven't done anything there, but really to kickstart uh, the washroom facilities and future buildings, they are looking for help to get the main water and sewer lines uh, into, into the property. Thank you very much, Mr. Spear. So as indicated that there's two potential lines of funding, obviously through the trail money, but also through the tourism accommodation levy. Um, in the report, obviously there's, there's the benefits and, and, and some concerns over this particular. Uh, so it's kind of over at us council. Um, typically you might see a, a motion for support, but this is kind of a, a check in first uh, to see uh, what we're thinking. A uh, quick question just to kick off is, um, is sortie themselves supportive as far as we know because basically if we were to to take funds and put it in this project it, it realistically means that there might be a portion of trail as a result of opportunity costs that we won't be able to complete so um, I guess is sortie 100 percent or is that something we should follow up with we can follow up on I don't know if we've been communicated directly I've heard informally that they aren't necessarily in support of this request and diverting funds away from trail building but we haven't had any formal um, notification from any of their executive okay uh, yes absolutely deputy um uh, mr spear if you say that the old the line will last 100 years what happened to the old line that was there when they had the washroom so the old line was probably 300 years old, to be honest, but it was installed by the Algonquin in the day. It's a really small line that comes from top of the hill instead of from the subdivision side where this one would be run against like off the line serving cemetery. And so it was just too small. And frankly, we don't know where it goes anymore. We were, everyone had concerns that it could be rooted or, you know, it's old materials. So it just wasn't a really good option. It's also quite small. It did serve as that little building there, but if, Katie's Cove Inc. is able to fulfill their, um, their, all their initiatives with several buildings and things, it probably wouldn't be sufficient to service, uh, or that existing line wouldn't be sufficient to service. So I'm sorry, you're, um, the Algonquin is going to put more than buildings, or is it Katie's Cove Inc. is going to put Katie's more Katie's Cove Inc. is the one who uh, has the initiative. So they've got into a, I said 25 years, it might be a 50 year lease to be honest, I haven't looked at it for a couple of years. Mm. 20. 20 years. 20? Okay, 20 sorry, years? I forgot one of the okay. representatives was here. So a 20-year lease um, and uh, with a renewable clause, I think, though. But nonetheless, it was them who were, you know, the Algonquin gave them permission to put these facilities on the property. And we've had probably two to three years ago, the pre those that were on the previous council had seen that they had multiple buildings and things on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship and Council and Mr. Spear. I'm just great with math here, not really. Anyway, the cost is 125,000 and uh, Katie's Inc. has raised 80. Am I correct on this? So are we looking at a $45,000? 
I think, now I could be wrong, but I, my assumption was that the 80 was to be used on the building on top and our 125 was to be used on the infrastructure to meet okay. the building. So okay. the whole project would be $205,000. All right, that's what I needed clarification. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spear. Thank you, Worship. Councillor Blanchard. Yeah, just uh, some further clarification, because one of the recommendations was possibility of a well, um, and then again, not really knowing whether it would be potable water or not for the, for the uh, uh, washroom, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference, but it does sound like there are additional plans to, to construct uh, other buildings outside of just the washroom, so is the requirement then to have sort of potable versus the non-potable, so I'm just trying to figure out if, if the well is even an option. If they're, I mean, for the washroom, it sounds like it would be p potentially, but, but outside of that, it's not going to be sufficient. Is that, is that my understanding that correctly? You are, but I guess all, we know in the present time, all they have funding for is the washrooms. So um, I can't speak to other buildings. I don't think they had restaurants or anything on in the original plan. I know, I don't no. want to put the other member here. No, I, here, your worship. Um, uh, so it was, uh, I'll blow my ears off. Um, so from the original plan that was presented to uh, the previous council, it highlighted um, like a kayak uh, area, canoe area, as well as like a, a, a canteen style. And then there was a washroom and some uh, change rooms and, and basically revitalizing it in that light. Uh, but there was no concept of a full service restaurant. It was more of a, a canteen. But on that point, it does bring up a, a a good segue is this council has not seen that presentation is that correct the full presentation on what the finish line looks like uh, not that it will ever be finished because you're consistently upgrading but you you, you need to see the whole plan um, and, and I guess I'll take it a step further it's not that the lands for sale but there's been a reoccurring challenge that we have some great volunteers that are involved with Katie's Cove Inc and they're working really hard but unfortunately they can't get charitable status because they don't own the land. So if you're going to make a significant investment into that project, you have to make sure that they can get to the finish line. Because if they don't get to the finish line, it could resort back to the current owners of the property. Um, so I think there's a larger conversation, and again, it might be even almost something for closed session as it's re related to land, but the town at some point, I do think, is going to have to sit down with Katie's Cove Inc and sit down with the Algonquin Hotel and figure out if it's something this council and, and staff would like to consider is what is our role. If the town did own the land, they could have a tax receipt. And without tax receipts, they're having a hard time getting to the amount of money that they need. And it's, it's uh, a, a bigger conversation. Obviously, the Algonquin Hotel would need to provide their input. Katie's Cove Inc. would need to provide their input in the town. But the concern is, is that if you put $125,000 into this and something goes wrong, is that's $125,000 of tax dollars money that has gone into a private business. So there is risk with this. I think everybody at this table from conversations I've had with you would love to see Katie's Cove return to the way that it used to be. I'm, I'll just say that unless the town gets involved, I question if it's going to get to that point. So it's something, a bigger conversation that I think we're going to have to have. Uh, uh, and uh, to be honest, what I think I would be looking for for, is for direction is to, to have a conversation what that looks like and bring it back to you before you put $125,000 into this property. Uh, th how does that, does that make sense to everybody? Like, that's what I'm thinking happened because you have to see the whole picture, but we also have to know that if you put that money into it, everything's going to happen. <laughs> and it's secure. And I really think that Katie's Cove Inc. would probably open the door to have more meaningful conversations with the town to try to get to that finish line. Any, any thoughts on those comments? Uh, Councilor Hurdle. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. You, you beat me to the punch on a lot of that stuff too, so I appreciate uh, your, your comments on that. Uh, I, I did want to make the point by saying for, um, for, those of us, for those of you that are watching at home and are, are listening to this, to, to please, you know, in, uh, you're not familiar with the project, to become familiar with the project. Um, for those of us that know the history of the community, um, Katie's Cove was, is a f fundamental part of, of that, and some of my fondest memories do come from uh, time spent uh, at that beach. So if, if you're not sure what it looks like, uh, you know, ask any one of us, find out, and uh, become part of the project, and, and, and do give them a hand. Um, my, 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 uh, the issue that I had again was around the fact that this isn't public, public property, unfortunately. Um, and you know, Mr. Spear, you mentioned a public washroom. 
but I don't think that's actually the case in this. It wouldn't be a public washroom, it would be a private washroom that I would imagine we would, you'd still need to get through the gate to get access to, so it wouldn't be part of the trail network. Um, you'd, you'd actually have to be in, in the park to be, to be in there. Or Maybe not, I, oops, sorry. I thought actually they were gonna put it along the parking lot just because it was a closer access to the, the lines and stuff instead of digging into the beach, but point nonetheless, even though it's still accessible by the trail, it's still on private property that right. theoretically could be closed off in 21 years. And there's questions about maintenance and about utilization and if people from the town are using it, do we have a part to play in that? So I think, uh, Your Worship, that we really need to have a better idea of, uh, of how, we, uh, how we relate to this project. And uh, you know, if we can obviously possibly down the road acquire this property, that would be, I think, a tremendous move forward. Councilor Gumichel. Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to thank you for your leadership on this issue. I think a uh, uh, discussion with all the parties involved, including Sorty, uh, if you could do that sooner than later, would be good because they, KCI has some momentum and uh, I think they're pushing for this year. So if we could do something sooner than later and get everyone out at the table, I think it's, uh, that would be time well spent. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Any other member of council? Okay. Oh, Councillor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship, uh, we, we speak about Sorty and we speak about the Algonquin and we speak about Katie's. I think it somehow it could be a working in progress partnership. Um, I see like if we could make Sorty part of it with the washrooms that would be accessible for the trail plus Katie's Cove, I think we could perhaps sell that easier than we could if we were putting it inside the fence. That's just my own personal opinion. I think that Katie's and Inc. has done a terrific job. Um, they've worked against uh, time uh, in, during COVID. Um, they've done everything they possibly can. I think we just uh, don't give up. We don't drop the ball yet. I think we just need to do some more investigation. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Heenan. So I'll just get consensus that uh, Council is giving me direction with town staff to reach out to both the Algonquin and Katie's Cove, Inc., uh, with consideration of Sorty as well, uh, to find out what a new partnership agreement could look like, one that would help them get their charitable status, one that would help them qualify for uh, grants that they currently can't, and come back and then we'll review it um, and, and see if this is something like an MOU or at least a land transfer that this council and staff is comfortable with. So I, I really think that that's, uh, it started with a request for funds for a washroom, but I think it's part of a bigger conversation and I'll, I'll be honest, I think this conversation for the community is, is long overdue. It's been a couple of years and it doesn't take away from the great work that the volunteers have been doing with Katie's Cove Inc. They've been doing a lot of work, they've been trying. It's just unfortunately they, kept, they keep getting met with the same challenge and I think potentially this council and staff could be a solution to that challenge. So thanks for your time. Just a quick show of hands, is that, does that make sense for everybody? Yeah, okay, so that will be a consensus, so we'll follow up with that after. So thank you very much. So I will go at this point to you, uh, Councillor Blanchard, for the next motion. Thank you, Your Worship. I think we are up to PW220306. Does that sound right? Your Worship. Oh, we're back. To we're back. Yeah. So let's, Sorry, let's just give it one more shot here. Let's just, <laughs> let's, let's just finish Councillor Blanchard's portfolio, and then we'll transition to Xander, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so active transportation fund application support motion. So the Town of St. Andrews has the opportunity to apply for the new Federal Active Transportation Fund. The fund will invest in projects that build new or expanded networks of pathways, bike lanes, trails, et cetera, in addition to supporting planning and stakeholder engagements. This is the first year of a five-year supporting fund of $400 million. Staff are making the recommendation to Council to support the grant application for Prince of Wales Street See the attached self, uh, staff report for background on Prince of Wales Street. One of the requirements of the application is to have a motion of council supporting the grant application. So the motion is that council supports the application to the Active Transportation Fund through the Government of Canada for the development of, and there are several options which we'll go through, for Prince of Wales Street and Indian Point Park. And I so move, or should I wait until we've actually decided on think, the option before we, we move this? When we get an amount, I think we'll move just because we'll just have to modify it Fair anyway. Enough. Yep. Um, so, uh, as you know, there's a few different options in here. So maybe I'll, I'll look to either Mr. Spear or Mr. Knopper just to, to guide through the process, just to make sure all members of, of council are aware of the different amounts and what we'd be looking for. 
Thank you, Council. Just give me one second here. Uh, my original uh, reaction would be to go uh, apply for, uh, I guess you could say, Plan A, uh, which would be the whole show, which would be the mm -hmm. uh, essentially sidewalk is what uh, jumps to mind for me. But go ahead, yeah. uh, Mr. Knopper. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. So uh, from the pr uh, report that you've been provided, um, so from the Active Transportation Fund, uh, there's 60% costs that are eligible within that. Uh, and, and they include everything from sidewalks, curbing, bike lanes, bridges, crosswalks, up to washrooms, lockers, bike stations. Um, so staff reviewed the active or the the transportation master plan that was that uh, the last council passed, uh, identifying one of the key areas that the the community looked to improve, which was Prince of Wales Street going from King Street down to Indian Point Park. <laughs> so what you're given are three options uh, within this. Uh, the first option is more of a description of what it would actually uh, potentially be. So um, you, it would be like a widening of the shoulder of 1.5 meters of asphalt and then uh, completing the basin. So option one that you're presented uh, is only for expanding the shoulder. Like that's not for repaving, that's not for all of that. And speaking with uh, Asset and Operations Manager Terry Acton, uh, Prince of Wales Street is on the books in asset management within the next five to seven years to actually be fully redone. So that's full pavement and, and resurfacing and, and all the work that needs to go with it. Um, so that's where options two and three come into play. So option two is uh, actually using, going for expanding, doing the full road work, but expanding the roadway to the 1.5 meters, giving an asphalt wide excavation and uh, active transportation lane. So it would have to be delineated with a, a white marker notifying that it is an active transportation lane. Uh, the goal would be to have this on the uh, western side of uh, the street, or if you're looking at it from another direction, it would be the southern part, uh, sticking with which side the, uh, the sidewalk is on the upper part of King Street. And basically it would just be the widening the shoulder asphalt lane that way. And that comes out with a full uh, gamut there of uh, nearly $850,000 to do that project. Uh, when you're looking at option three, it's more of looking at sidewalks, curbs, and having uh, a proper sidewalk installed on the street. So council needs to decide which direction they would like staff to apply towards for funding. Uh, you'll notice that the breakdowns are there of the 60% estimated cost of what we could get in returns. Uh, it does increase as we do increase the project, but again, project costs also increase. So staff are just seeking direction from council on that, as well as uh, from, the dis, uh, from the grant itself, washrooms are also an option that can be added to this. And something that was discussed pre in previous councils was the installation of a washroom in and around Indian Point Park at the corner there. Now with uh, the look of uh, Sorties Exercise Park there and looking like, and the bird watching platform, it is an option to look at, especially as uh, pertaining to the active transportation links within the community. So that would be another suggested on top of that we could add to the grant application to see if we can be successful with it. So those are the options that are being presented to council. So um, with that being said, council, um, a few different options there, but um, the fact that Prince of Wales needs to be done in the, let's call it the near future, um, it makes sense to obviously incorporate that project and Personally, uh, I actually think that a sidewalk there would be greatly appreciated. Um, I would say that if you think of active transportation and actually routes that are in the community, walking around the loop of the town is still the most popular route for actually walkers, and that is probably one of the most dangerous areas, uh, especially in the morning when people are going to school, there's walkers there. So I think a sidewalk would be a wonderful addition, and I know it's a big amount, but um, we're gonna have to face doing the road anyway, so we can uh, utilize this fund to help get that. The only question is, does everybody feel the same? I, I personally think a sidewalk there, especially the fact it goes by our elementary school, would be a, would be a game changer. Thoughts? Councilor Hurdle. Yeah, I just would like to say, just to echo that point and support it as well, thank you, Your Worship. I think that um, um, transportation infrastructure needs to be judged by the safety of its most vulnerable users. And uh, I, I, you know, with all due respect, I understand that transportation, active transportation lanes are often a cost-effective approach, but I don't think we'd feel comfortable with our most vulnerable users basically walking on the road without a protected curb, without a sidewalk itself. Um, you wouldn't think, like, having toddlers walking on the shoulder of the road versus on a sidewalk, I think all of us would say we'd feel much more comfortable with uh, vulnerable users using the sidewalk. So 
uh, I think that's the direction we should go. Sounds good. Um, Councilor Blanchard. Thanks, Your Worship. So, yeah, I actually agree as well. Um, I agree with the sidewalk, the, the third option. I did have a question, though, on uh, the tree removal, because it does mention uh, from Ernest down to the trail, we're talking about some removal, uh, removal of some, some mature trees. I know we also heard from staff uh, a little while back that I believe an arborist had done sort of a, an audit, I guess, if you will, or an assessment of the trees on, on Prince, uh, uh, Prince of Wales, and many were getting closer to the end of their life expectancy anyway. So I wanted to make that clear to uh, the community when they are sort of looking at this project. Um, I did want to know how many trees potentially, though, could or would have to be removed, and if we've budgeted for maybe tree replacement as part of this project, because I think it's important if we are taking trees down, we should budget to have uh, trees replaced as well. As, again, part of our, our uh, um, climate change emergency, we did talk about uh, uh, carbon sequestration. So if we are removing some of the ability to, to pull down carbon, I think we should maybe be planting some as well to try and replace what we lose. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and you answered my question about whether the washrooms were extra or, or included, and it sounds like they're extra as well. Um, I guess one last question, though. Um, do we know the cost of, the, the budgeted cost for the resurfacing of Prince of, uh, uh, Prince, uh, Prince of Wales as, as part of that five-year to seven-year uh, plan? Just, I'm just curious to know what we'd be looking to spend anyways and, and how, it would, uh, how it would sort of factor in. So or was the total resurfacing cost essentially what we have? That's, that's essentially, yeah, what's been sort of budgeted for. That's correct. What's, what's been provided in the report is what was directly provided from. Right, and actually the, the, the part of that I did want to ask was, was included in that cost um, upgrading of the storm mains because this actually calls for the upgrading of the storm, ma storm, uh, storm water mains as well. So that's, that was the question Op I wanted to ask. Option uh, three, Your Worship, option three would be the complete redo of the storm drains the, uh, and all of that. Uh, but what was budgeted out, I guess, for the five-year or the seven-year uh, asset management, was that including storm water main uh, upgrades as well or just the resurfacing? No. Okay. Okay, no, all right, from, that was the from, question. I from had. our understanding, it would be just the resurfacing of the road and the fixing of culverts. Okay. If there's an opportunity to expand and, and go in this direction to put in proper um, curb and sidewalk, the proper storm would have to be put in. Okay, no, that's great. And like I said, the, the only question then, the outstanding question would be the number of trees. Do we know the number of trees? Uh, in speaking with the uh, asset manager, we estimate anywhere from 15 to 20 trees would have to come down within that zone. Uh, and they are, a lot of them are on their way out as you reiterated, we had the, the, the report on that. And actually within some of the costing of this and from the grant itself, we can actually apply for re-landscaping, replanting of trees and, and sod in the area. So that was part of the goal would be to, whatever we take it would be replaced. Okay, because I, I did see that in the, uh, I guess, the report from, uh, is it CB? CBCL. CBCL, they did mention in, in, in a couple of cases about sod, but I didn't see anything about trees specifically in, in, in the report, so I just wasn't sure if it had been incorporated yep. into uh, what we were talking, into the uh, Through you, Your Worship, within the actual grant itself, it actually specifically highlights trees as a replacement tool, and that would... Yeah, I did see that. I just, I didn't yeah. see it in the CBCL uh, uh, report there, so I, was, it, I wasn't sure. It's a good question just for, for council to consider, is that is one of the most scenic streets with trees, um, and I don't think the average public realizes that so many of them are coming to the end of their life cycle. And I think it would be a shock factor to cut 15 trees, 20 trees. Um, so if we are gonna do that, to your point, I think we need to actually find the extra funds to put in mature trees uh, and also uh, make the public aware of this actually for the long term for the be beautification of our, of our town is actually better because they are gonna slowly transition out. Uh, but it's also something for council and staff to consider is, as of late, we're trying to get trees away from our roads and away from our sidewalks because of the damage they do. We're gonna have to make a big decision on that because if you plant them close to the road, it does impact the life cycle of the asset because it, it damages them, right? So um, we're gonna have to really talk about that tree planting policy as part of this because again, if you cut that, it's gonna be a shock when you drive down there. It's that simple, but um, with that being said, they're going anyway, so if you were going to replant them, it makes sense to put exactly what you need for the future at the same time. So, um, any other questions from any member of council? Councilor Gumashal. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just wanted to thank staff for all their hard work on this, Mr. Knopper and Mr. Acton. Uh, uh, we're able to put this together in uh, short measure, and uh, their, their efforts are much appreciated. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councilor Gumashal. Councilor Heenan. 
Yes, Your Worship and Council. Um, just to reiterate one more time, we know we have the problem with tree issues around, and there are people who unfortunately do not watch council, et cetera, and all of a sudden they'll see a tree being cut down. I believe that in some way, if we go to do this, that a sign be placed on each one of the trees that is certified that says this tree is at its end of its life, needs to be replaced. I, I don't think it needs to be a huge sign. I just think it needs to be something so that people can actually read it and see it. That's a good point. Maybe we'll do a town mail out and have a town hall a copy of the actual arborist report so they can yes. actually that's not hide I'm anything. Thank you, Your yeah, Worship. That's, that's a good point. Um, and the other thing to consider is this is just to apply for the grant. We still will have to have a more formal conversation if we are successful. So it's not the, it's not the finish line by any means. Councilor Blanchard. Just one quick comment, perhaps, since we are sort of uh, putting a lot of attention on the trees. Uh, I, I do think it might be uh, something to consider for the, uh, for the community, uh, an urban tree uh, strategy, uh, just to identify some of these trees and, and do all the things that you know, we should be, do, be doing to ensure, let people in the community know we are, we are looking at every, every single tree and, and ensuring that, uh, like I said, there's a reason. If it has to come down, there's a reason. But we have a, a plan, a strategy in place to replace what we're, what we're losing. So I think that would be an important thing to consider maybe in the future. Absolutely. So that's something that if we are successful, we should certainly, uh, even if we don't, we should be actually looking to develop that. But it's uh, safe to say that uh, we're, we're looking to go ahead with this, but we know that there is a level of transparency and public communication to let them know why we're doing this and, and why it's needed. Deputy Mayor, I could you saw your hand? Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Um, I just want to um, thank staff and everyone who put into this, but also to say that, um, as you say, that drive down Prince of Wales is very um, picturesque, so taking the trees away is going to be a big shock to a lot of people. So I think the more that we can be vocal about this and what's actually happening will be a good idea. But um, I liked Councillor Hurdle's uh, statement that it is for um, the people that we care for a lot. I know as being a teacher, uh, we use the point and walk around for Terry Fox Day. We walk around the point for um, many different times that, you know, throughout the year. So having a sidewalk would be so much better than having the whole school walk around the side and we have to watch for traffic. This would at least give them a little bit of protection. So we are protecting our investment, which are our youth. And um, I thank Council for all their work towards this. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so at this point, uh, let's get some uh, values associated with this. The other, the other thing that we have to discuss is the washroom, I think, just to round this out. I think I'm hearing enough consensus to say sidewalk uh, and obviously to redo the road that we have to redo anyway. Um, so the question is on washroom. My thoughts on it, and I'll see if Council feels the same, is I would love to put it in there because we have tourism accommodation levy funds and we could allocate some of that towards this project because we know we need more washroom facilities in the community. The only thing I will say is when you look at the cleaning of the town washrooms at every washroom we do add, it's a significant increase in our operate, operating budget. So just as we look to develop these, it's not like we can have eight washrooms in town and afford to do it. So we need to be strategic on it. But I do think that if you, if you look at the actual town plot and the land that we own, that would be a strategic location for us down there. And uh, of course, they're working towards the outdoor exercise equipment, which also would benefit from this as well. So um, Council, just a quick consensus. Are you thinking the washroom to include as well? Just seeing it. All right, so that's, that's majority. So um, with that being said, with the washroom, um, the sidewalk, the resurfacing, what is the total number? I know that there's a few in here. Was the washroom included one of those numbers or no? The, the we have three year worship the washroom would be an added sixty five thousand though onto the okay so I'd be on top of the let me go back here I'm getting ahead of myself your worship just so if you don't mind one you, other point you talked about the washrooms but you also have to realize we're starting to get to the end of the bit what we're able to do with sidewalk plows too that with our current route so as we add more there may be a need to add more equipment and personnel and winter snow clearance removal too. That's a valid point. Just so you know that could be coming your way. And um, just looking at the numbers, adding in the trees and stuff, I'd say maybe put a figure of 1.7 million okay. in the motion and staff will have to get engineering reports and everything anyway to submit it with it. So mm -hmm. that should cover it, especially with inflation that we've had. 
Absolutely. So thank you for that number. So Councillor Blanchard, would you feel good inserting that uh, number and, and kind of reading the motion? I'll see if I can get a seconder and then we can debate it. Uh, I would, Your Worship, oh, your worship uh, in the blank space here talks about for the development of, and it's, I think it's more referring to option as opposed to a dollar figure. What would you like me to do there? Do you want the dollar figure? Or I, you want I, I think we should put the dollar figure. Does that make sense? Your Worship, I would, I would recommend um, when you're listing it out, uh, go Government of Canada for the development of sidewalks, curbs, and washrooms at $1.7 million for active transportation for Prince of Wales and... So, sure, I got all that. <laughs> so, Councillor Blanchard is moving for that. Is that correct, Councillor Blanchard? Correct. Can we have a seconder for that? <laughs> Councillor Heenan seconded that. We'll open that up for discussion. I know we talked about it at length, but just making sure. All right, we'll call the qu question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. And aye. that is everybody. So, uh, you can just insert that in, <laughs> Mr. Knopfer. We uh, appreciate that, and thanks for uh, summarizing that very quickly for us. Um, at this point, we're jumping ahead to uh, Councillor Hurdle's portfolio, which is business your, tours. Your Worship, can we oh, jump sorry. back to the presentation? Let's, let's go back to this time. let's go back to Xander. Xander, can you say something? He's enjoying it, but we'll we'll switch to him. Everybody hear me? Yeah, it's getting better. Keep Good. talking. Okay. okay. All right. Um, isn't technology wonderful? Uh, so. I'll share my screen and hopefully I think that should work for everybody. Hopefully. You're good. You're good. Great. Okay. So uh, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, don't want to take up too much time. And I know there'll be a little bit of discussion on this uh, or at least a motion coming up. So this is the public presentation. It's all good. You're good, Xander. Uh, this is the public presentation of um, a rezoning application for 258 Montague Street, um, more commonly known as the Montague Rose uh, Bed and Breakfast uh, and Tea Room. Um, and the owners and applicants are Benjamin and Zainab Faulkner Malik. So, a bit of background uh, the BNB itself has operated on the site for some time um, 10, 20 years, I'm not sure exactly how long, but, but quite a while. Um, when the uh, Faulkner Malik's purchased it uh, last year, they received a temporary use authorization from PRAC uh, before St. Andrews had their own PAC to operate a tea room, um, which we would consider a restaurant under the zoning bylaw, uh, open to the general public. Um, now you can obviously serve food and bed and breakfasts uh, in the service residential zone, but you cannot serve members of the general public. So the temporary use allowed them to serve the general public for a year. And that year is coming up to an end in May of uh, this year. Um, when that was approved, there were some conditions on the temporary use related to parking and hours of operation. As well, I don't want to get too bogged down in this stuff. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, but uh, building code um, did play a role in this file. Uh, and it's for anybody listening, if, if you want to buy an old building and turn it into something that the public is going to come into, it can be a challenge. Um, so there was a lot of creative work by our uh, building inspectors and by the applicants to find um, some kind of solution. Uh, and that will come into play a little bit later with some of the recommended conditions for uh, this. So anyways, they've, um, as the year is coming to an end, they have made an application to rezone to the tourist commercial zone, uh, which would be the most appropriate zone in this case. Um, we've seen this before, but uh, the municipal plan generalized future land use map shows this property as being residential and to be in the tourist commercial zone, it needs to be uh, commercial. So that's, um, a process that would happen at the same time. And this public presentation is technically about the municipal plan amendment, um, not about the rezoning, but they're effectively the same matter. Um, one of the nice things about temporary use authorizations is that, is that they can test out a business, not just for the owners, but also for the neighborhood. Um, so during this year long period of uh, tea room operation, we heard nothing about any issues from this property. Um, and I don't believe town staff did either. So. Uh, it, it operated well and the owners uh, want to keep going, um, basically. So there's the zoning map. Um, it's next to, uh, it's actually a uh, caddy corner from where everybody is sitting right now. Um, you could almost just walk out and see the property. Um, 
And then, of course, there's the green space, uh, the sledding hill uh, next to it. And then there are a couple of properties on the north side of it. And there's the aerial view. Uh, and that's a picture that was taken last uh, year sometime. Um, parking area. So in considering these, we have to look at some other municipal plan policies. Uh, there's an economic policy that encourages the further development and promotion of significant artistic, cultural, recreational assets uh, with a view toward increasing economic opportunities and cultural tourism throughout the year. Um, and then there's also a housing policy, which mostly relates to um, uh, home-based businesses. And this is now sort of departing from a home-based business, um, although the owners would still live there. Um, but uh, the purpose here is that there should be conditions to minimize the effect of the home-based business. So um, the fact that this is in the middle of a residential neighborhood, um, that does uh, have some impact on um, how it should be treated. And given that it lasted for a year with no issues, it can um, probably reasonably continue with no issues, but there may have to be conditions placed on it. Um, I'll just go back to uh, the economic policy for a second. Um, there's uh, one of the nice things about the BNB so far is that it's, you know, this is a historic building, um, it's uh, a cultural asset, and guests have been able to see the inside and experience that, but the members of the public. Um, including many residents of St. Andrews, may never have actually been able to do that. As well, um, a tea room uh, is, is kind of a cultural uh, institution of itself. Obviously, there's a long history in the British Empire of tea, um, and that uh, it, it seems like it should fit very well into St. Andrews and a lot of the other cultural activities um, that happen when people come to visit. So, uh, in staff's opinion, the rezoning does meet the municipal plan goals, um, but it does require conditions added by resolution before a third reading. Um, again, we want to keep those hours of operation and parking um, there, uh, make sure the parking stays on the property, um, doesn't cause issues for the neighborhood. There are already requirements in the zoning bylaw relating to that. Um, and then in addition, our building inspector recommends um, a few things that have to do uh, basically with um, safety um, and and sort of this compromise that allows the public to come in, um, but means that the applicants don't have to do uh, incredibly expensive renovations. Um, so it does limit it slightly. If council does place these as conditions by resolution, uh, they can always be changed by resolution. So if the applicants decide to um, go through the uh, effort of updating the building, um, they these conditions could be amended. So that's it, um, and uh, I will stop there. And I don't know if uh, there's questions now or if it would make sense to hold those for the motion when it comes around, but I'm here and I can at least speak. I don't know if I can hear everybody, but we'll make it work. Xander, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so those recommendations and the terms and conditions, would they be con fairly consistent with what they've been operating over the last year? It was a little muddy. You might have to repeat that for me, Paul. Uh, Xander, were the terms and conditions how they've operated over the last year? Yes. Yes. Um, the, the building permit had those conditions on it that relate to building code. And the building permit actually only lasts for as long as the temporary use. It's something we can do or the building inspector can do. They can do a time limited building permit um, and that was for a change of occupancy even though no work was done a change of occupancy um, is uh does require um everything to meet code um so that's because it's moving from a particular type of residence to a particular type of business it's it's very technical um but the conditions for both the kind of land use and for the building code things have been there uh for the whole year and then just my follow-up question is over the last year, I know we would have a hearing of objections after we go to first reading, it's, it's the other motion, but have we had any complaints over the last year over the operation that town staff or, or Mr. Gopin's aware of? 
uh, through you, Your Worship, from town standpoint, we've heard zero complaints regarding this business and operation. All right, that, uh, that sums up uh, my point. Um, any other member of council? C Councillor Blanchard. Just quickly, I, I, uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Mr. Gopin. Um, I, I, I understand, I guess, uh, sort of just about everything there on the terms and conditions with regards to building codes and limiting the number of patrons, patrons and where they have access to. The only one I guess I was a little questioning was, was reservations are required. Um, sort of dictating sort of the operations of the business itself as a, and not allowing sort of walk-ups. I'm just wondering if, I, I, again, I understand, you know, uh, uh, services are to end at 7 p.m., but that was the only one of the terms and conditions that I kind of questioned a little bit, and I just... Was yeah, um, that's a good question, and that actually has to do with building code, um, and it has to do with... Um, it's, it's, it's a little complicated but um if you think of a business like um basically by allow by having reservations it, it controls the the inflow and outflow of people um so that there aren't too many people in there at the same time i think it would be fairly easy from a business perspective for somebody to come in and say you know i'd like to make a reservation for um you know very soon from now and that that could be accommodated assuming there weren't too many people there currently um, but it's just basically to make sure that there really are no more than 12 patrons at any one time. Okay, okay. thank you. Appreciate that. Any other member of council? We'll be debating this here momentarily. So uh, if anything comes up, uh, that'll be another chance to do it. So thank you very much, Sandra. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll go at this point uh, ahead back to the actual motions, and it would be uh, Councillor uh, Hurdle's uh, portfolio. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is in reference to BTHC 220203, and the subject is the Anglican Church Parish Request for Support for Repairs to Cemetery Pillars Discussion. Uh, and the background is that on February 7th, 2022, with the regular council meeting, the Anglican Chair, uh, Church Parish requested support to repair the pillars for the Loyalist Cemetery. Council tabled discussion until a policy was in place for the tourism accommodation levy. Council directed staff to bring the Anglican Church request back once the policy was complete. Council can discuss options on supporting the request from the Angli Anglican Parish. Uh, Council should be aware in the decision-making process for this request as the town has not provided funds for cemeteries in the past and it may create precedents. Um, and the original request was that the town of St. Andrews received a letter on behalf of the Anglican Church Parish for a request of funds to help support the repairs to the pillars in the Loyalist Cemetery. Uh, see the attached document for a copy of the letter. The letter noted that there are 10 pillars in need of repair. The estimated cost of repairs to the pillars is uh, $17,250. The Anglican Church is asking if the town would consider partnering on this project to repair the pillars as the cemetery has historical significance and could be considered with tourism significance to the community. Uh, please see the staff report attached for additional information. And the, the motion is, uh, um, sorry, and I saw move. Yeah, I lost so, my thoughts there for a second. So the motion would be for 50% funding, is that correct? It's not It's not actually in the report, but it'd be for- Your, your Worship, at this point, we're, staff are just bringing it forward for discussion. Okay. There is no, there was a motion prior that issued 50%, but it was advised that council should have a full discussion before developing a motion. So, so ideally you get consensus for, to bring a motion forward in two weeks to finalize this, is that correct? Okay. So, uh, Council, um, you have the background. We have had this before us so again. Is there any, uh, any thoughts? I will uh, just uh, state that I have had communication um, that there's another cemetery in the community that is um, keeping an active eye on this to see if this is something that we will start funding. So precedence, to some degree, will be set. But with that being said, every cemetery is different. Some are active, some aren't. Um, it doesn't mean that every cemetery <laughs> necessarily gets 50% of, of, of what they need. So, Councillor Hurdle, I saw your hand. Yeah, thank you. I guess that would be the, the major consideration for me is, is the precedent this would set. There are, a, 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 not to say a lot, but a significant number of uh, cemeteries in the community. So I guess my question, I'm not sure this can be answered today, is if this request is a local request, if it comes from the Anglican Church Parish here in town directly to us, or if this request has actually come through the Anglican Church of Canada, to us, because that would be a significantly different consideration if they've approached the Anglican Church of Canada first um, to inquire if there's funding available for these kinds of projects. And if we could discover that, that might make our decision a lot easier. I'll, I'll look to uh, Mr. Knopper or Mr. Spear on this one. I don't believe they have. I think this came directly on a local level. Is that correct? 
You're correct, Your Worship. This did come through as a local level, not through the Anglican Church of Canada. The other thing that I do want council to consider on this one too is uh, not that the project doesn't merit investment and it doesn't mean that um, you don't do it, but I just question uh, if the tourism accommodation levy is really the fund to be get, uh, to do these repairs. I, I, if, if I was involved with Explorer St. Andrews, I would question this financial purchase, uh, this financial commitment for the simple fact that I know people come to visit loved ones, but I'm not really sure if that is uh, a strategic uh, enough, uh, I guess you'd say, endeavor for them to think that it was, uh, it aligned with the fund. Oh, sorry. Something to take into consideration is we had concerns, well, not concerns, but we said that there could be other cemeteries that come forward. But the truth is, any kind of heritage project or worthwhile project that enhances the community could come forward. So we're making kind of investment in a capital item on a public space so to speak and so there's other areas that could come forward with that too so just understand we created that policy two months ago and again i'm not yay or nay on what the best use of the funds is but it's just to take that into consideration is that it could open up the floodgates to other not necessarily just graveyards but other similar style um, structures being put forward and we can think of lots in the community that could require some more funding. Now remind me, we used to have a line item for actually heritage initiatives. I know it was related originally around the heritage bylaw. I'm wondering, did we put a placeholder in for any funds this year? I, 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 nothing's jumping. I believe it was a small amount of there was. It, yeah, I don't think there's anything because it had gone untouched for four or five years. So I think council just elected to they came up with a purpose or at least a policy on what heritage funds could be used for they elected to remove it from the budget items for this year and uh just a follow-up question on that is is this like have to do it this year or is this a situation where we could do it part of budget time when we're looking at all the other projects it's almost like an assistance grant more than it is a, a tourism grant in my mind um but uh is it something that absolutely has to happen this year i guess we can't speak on behalf of the uh, proponent they haven't put that they wanted to do it this year but I think the understanding was if they got the money they'd probably have it completed this year okay uh, any, any member of council any other questions uh, councillor Heenan thank you worship and council um, it, it's a uh, it's a catch-22 because the cemetery does fall into tourism uh, because of its historic value however Usually, however, I do not believe that the money for tourism that should be paying to have it fixed. I, I strongly believe that that is not the use of the levy fund. Um, even though the cemetery can be deemed as a tourist destination, but so can a lot of other spots in town be seen as a tourist destination. And I'm just worried that we're going to move far away from what this levy fund is really intended for. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Thank you, Councillor Heenan. I'll be, uh, well, we'll have to get some consensus on this. So uh, does anyone think we should bring this forward or does it, or would people prefer that we uh, let them know that the tourism accommodation levy is not the appropriate fund and we uh, would love, we would consider it during budget time, but also do a call to other churches and other organizations to hear what their needs are as well when it comes before we allocate the funds. Councilor Hurdle. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, it's always difficult decisions to make in these circumstances because I, I don't think anybody here is not saying that these aren't worthy of restoration and protection and, uh, and care. And, and all of us, I think, would get involved if there were a volunteer effort to sort of restore these and fundraiser of some kind. But in order for us to stretch the town money over into this project, I just don't think it, it can stretch that far. Um, but I'd be encouraged to hear if we can bring it forward to the budget for next year, what else we can do. But I don't think this is the right place. Okay. Uh, Council Blanchard? I, I, I actually agree with that as well. I, 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 I like the idea of what you mentioned earlier about a, heri a potential heritage fund or something to that effect that, again, was sort of not accessed previously, but perhaps in a future budget cycle, like, you know, next year's budget cycle, maybe bringing something like that, something like that back. I think, as Councillor Hurdle had said, um, you know, the... This, I mean, this town, this community, the, the historical aspect of it. I mean, it, it's so it's so key to our identity. I think it makes sense for the for for the town to uh, to look to assist where we can 
to preserve, to restore, to do what we can and to, to try and uh, help in some of these situations, but agreed. I don't know that the, the, uh, the TALB is the right way to go in this one. Thank you, Council Manager. So just a quick show of hands, unless someone has something new. To do you want anything else? I, anything or, I just want to add my voice to the fact that I don't think the TALB is the right spot, but I do think in budget we should be thinking about the maybe the uh, heritage line to to help with these assets that are getting old. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. That's majority. So I, I do think that we should have a conversation at budget time about potentially adding a heritage fund where people can apply for grants related to those projects. So thank you, Council. I think we have consensus on that. All right. The next one actually is Councillor Gumichel, uh, but it's uh, again it will be another uh, discussion versus a, a motion. <laughs> um, so. Uh, at this point, I think we should jump over to maybe Mr. Knopper, is that correct, for this one, or Mr. Spear, actually? Thank you, Worship. And this one we don't need a hard decision on tonight because there's still quite a few steps to go. But uh, we had a meeting with Sorty, on, and they're going through the funding process for exercise equipment. And if you remember back in January or February, Council approved that this equipment be placed at the point. So we had a uh, dis discussions with them about what they, they're planning on doing and originally they said that they're just going to because of cost they wanted to place the equipment on sonal tubes and leave it grassed and the equipment there and staff had some concerns about it first on the look but also for mowing it be a bit of a challenge uh, we're concerned, especially with people with, that might have accessibility issues, that going through grass might be a, a bit of a, a struggle. And then, if, as you can guess, you might find this hard to believe, but we don't always have hot sun here, that sometimes we get rain and fog. So it gets a little bit muddy sometimes if in an area under playground equipment and things, as you can imagine. So we just can see where it's a bit of a safety hazard as well. So uh, Mr. Acton being Mr. Acton came up with what we think is a pretty good idea, but it is going to cost some funds. So if you look at page 157 of your plan, he's basically come up with a circular style platform that um, involves interlocking bricks, much similar to the sidewalks that we put at Elizabeth Street Park last year. That would create a solid foundation. Uh, we'd probably have to put some mats, we were saying, uh, rubber mats under some of the equipment where there's a higher potential of a fall and things. But as you can see, the good thing about those bricks are is um, one, if there's more expansion in the future, they can be removed as opposed to other things, which, you know, even sono tubes, if they start to tilt, you get to pull everything off. These bricks can be moved, gravel or sand can be put underneath them and raised. If th the park grows in the future, it, um, it, uh, allows you to add more bricks and create a larger platform. And as we know, the, the ground's a little bit unsettled along there, and th they will be shifting over years. I think we've all seen it now. I remember a couple of years ago, we brought in several loads of gravel close to that area because the ground was sinking. So it's a lot easier to manage with these interlocking bricks than if you put a much larger foundation there. And you see from that plan, he's also worked it out that someone uh, can, there, that if they get into that parking lot, there's a accessible parking space right beside the trail, so they're on the gravel. They get to the entranceway, which is now interlocking brick, and so anyone, you know, even like myself on a cane, but whatever the case, but people on walkers and wheelchairs are gonna have a lot easier time of going over that hard surface than necessarily going over um, grass. Yeah, so the, the, the problem is, again, sorties, uh, all of their money is going to go for the equipment. And please, in the diagrams, he just grabbed pictures of whatever he could find. The pictures on here don't reflect what the actual equipment's going to look like. It's just icons to hold up the space to get an idea. But you're probably talking thirty dollars to $50,000 for us to, to, to add that up and put that in there, excluding even the washrooms. But the thing is, it's a very highly visible space there, and I think it would give it a much more professional look and a much more appealing look. It might take away from the natural look a little bit, but I think, as we talked about before, for the accessibility and even for the longevity of the exercise equipment, we feel it's a better fit. You don't have to agree to it tonight. We just want to know if you buy into the concept that we can start pricing it, and because it's going to take quite a bit to figure that all out. And if you say, 
we love it, we'll go. If you say we hate it, then we know to look at alternative measures. Thank you. Perfect, Mr. Spear, appreciate that. Um, so has SORTI been approved for this grant already, or are they still waiting? Because there's from no- my under- Well, from my understanding, they're still waiting. But from my understanding as well, too, is we had a similar thing with the trails. Basically, if they approach, you make an application, and then if they come back and start digging for more information, they're giving you an awful hard look. So I'd say there's about a 50% chance at this or, or better that it's going, and I'm guessing a little bit, but I know the funding partners don't tend to keep digging for more information and then reject it. And again, it'd be probably a budget item for next year. We'd have to talk to Sorry, but if this is the way it goes, we'd probably tell them, you know, why don't we set our funds aside, you get the equipment, and then spring of next year, we start building this thing, and so it's up and running by May or June of 2023. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Spear. Uh, I just, I'll look for some council direction, but my thoughts would be, I, would, I don't think I would debate what we put under it until we know we have the funds. Um, and, uh, but I will say that I think if we're gonna do it, we do it the right way, because it's a highly visible area. And the other thing is on page 158, that diagram actually shows, I don't know if it's just the way it looks, it looks like there's a little tree, it looks like there's, looks like a rose bush, but anyway, it's landscaping. And I think that landscaping around it will definitely improve the, uh, the visual of it, because I think that's the main concern. Uh, everyone supports the project, they just wanna make sure it looks good. So um, I don't know if we have to get in the particulars of it, but uh, Councilor Blanchard? Just one additional thing, I guess, if we're talking about, you know, what additional things would be there. We are talking about washrooms. I'm just wondering about washrooms and we're having water there. Water fountains and things like that, are they also included in, in, in sort of what, you know, what we, with the washrooms or things, something like that? I'm just wondering, because what I'd like to see actually throughout town, and I know in COVID it's a little bit different, but uh, what I'd like to see around town are actually more stations where people could refill water as opposed to purchasing plastic water bottles, things like that. If people have the option to refill, I think that saves people going and purchasing a lot of plastic bottles. So I'm just wondering if, if that is a consideration that we could have where we are looking at washrooms and potentially a water supply. It can be, obviously, if we're going to have washrooms, we'll need some water supply. And ideally or logically, it's going to be from a water line somewhere, probably up a little bit on Prince of Wales, that'll be worked into this. So potable water fountains should be very easy to install. So Great, thank you. Good, good point on the washroom. So I think council, unless someone has, uh, go ahead, Council Hurdle. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, now this is just me thinking outside the box here. So this isn't necessarily something that I think we as council want or even something that I necessarily want. But on one hand, we do, I mean, we have a project that's uh, looking to find someone to start a gym in the community. We have some money that we need to, essentially, essentially some money that we need to spend by the end of the month or we lose a grant. Um, it, I, I'm just sort of thinking, can, if it's possible, is there room to sort of use that funding to acquire the equipment for this park and have Sorty redirect what they're spending their money on to make this park really nice? Like if we could do this really nicely by, by possibly rearranging that, I'm not, again, not saying this is something that even I want, but we have struggled to find someone to occupy the space with the gym. But uh, if we could go further with this, maybe this is something worth considering. Anyway, thank you. Uh, Mr. Knopper, do you know if funds could be relocated towards this equipment or at least towards the project? Uh, Your Worship, that would have to be a discussion with the funding body uh, because it was earmarked for an indoor fitness gym, but uh, theoretically speaking, maybe, (laughs) because it is is sharing similar functionalities with what an indoor versus an outdoor would be. It's just I'd have to speak with the funding partners on what their allocation would allow. It's it's a very good comment, Councillor Hurdle. I, I think it's something that, with Council con- consensus, I think we I'd like Mr. Knopper to explore. Um, we have been successful at finding a partner to run the fitness facility, and the other thing to be, uh, we do need a, a a place for Council to gather, so that space could be repurposed fairly easy for that if we went in a different direction. Um, and uh, to do again to do this to do it the right way, it just makes sense. Um, so that that's a great suggestion. I think it's something. Does everyone agree that's something staff should ex- should pursue? Yeah, okay, so that's consensus. There's a, there's enough consensus there to say that that's that's something we'd like to explore, and then we could just follow back. Again, though, we're running. We're yeah, your worship. I guess that's what we're saying. Um, I will say we've run out of time. You know, the, the funding 
ends at the end of this month. We don't have it on the agenda, but we maybe have to add, we should add an item to talk about the fitness center, what next steps are. We had a reply from one of the proponents last week that I forwarded to council and so if uh, I will be looking again, well, we can do it right now. I know it's a little yeah. impromptu, but we've talked about this a lot. I would say at this point, he can have the conversation and if that can work, great, but we need a plan B for you with clear direction now. Is that safe to say? Um, in my mind, I think since we haven't developed a plan, I, I almost think that is there not some equipment that we can get like resistance bands and things like that for, you know what I mean, where it doesn't take up physical space and it's things that we can use in the community, uh, in the dining room if we decide to go that direction, or a fitness facility if we go that way. Is that is that an option or? Through you, your worship, it is an option because some of the fitness equipment was for exercise bands, for those types of pieces of equipment, but the majority, that's minimal cost in comparison to what the $25,000 in grant funding is for. So we're in a situation now, council, where <laughs> we're going to lose the money if we don't come up with a plan and uh, it goes back to the fund fundamental conversation that we've had. Does the municipality think they should run a gym because that is the only option that we have today is if we want a gym the municipality itself will have to run. There's a lot of things to figure out on that but that's where we're at. Otherwise I would say we should be looking to purchase things that are movable to that point. Um, over to you council. What's your thoughts on this? Councillor Heenan. Your Worship, we've, um, since we've been on council, we've talked about this $25,000 and we've not really come up with a uh, precise plan for it. Um, it probably at some point, it's throwing good money after bad because in order for $25,000, let's say, to be able to be used, it could cost the town a position, a municipality position. Um, and I have to say, honestly, I don't think the space is really large enough for any kind of a public uh, gym. And I, I mean, $25,000, I don't like to look, you know, at a gift and let it go away. However, if it's going to cost us $200,000 to bring it into play, it may not be worth it. That's just my opinion. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Appreciate that, Councillor Heenan. Anyone else? All right. So um, I, that, it's a valid point uh, to spend this twenty-five thousand. Uh, the cleaning bill alone will probably be twenty-five thousand dollars a year after. Um, so it's a valid point. Uh, I I'd like council consensus on that comment to see if anyone's opposed. But I would say, Councillor Grimshaw. Yep. Wondering about the new rec director position and if, if we've had if that's been posted. If we have I had applicants and. and Da, 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 da. Like, it seems like we're giving up on the gym just as the rec director position is potentially coming into play. So, so the position's being advertised. It closes April the 4th. We actually want a discussion with you next meeting about how, if you how involved council wants to be, at least have a representative part, possibly part of the screening process. And um, so our internal plan is probably by early May we'll have someone on the ground running. Okay. So, so if, if we were to purchase um, mobile equipment, it might not, uh, it might be something that a, if we were able to find a rec director that was of that bent uh, or inclined to, to do a gym, we would, we could, uh, we could include them, you know what I mean? Um, perhaps, I don't know. You know, to your point, ideally that person's here and, and gives their input and it's another staff resource we have to to develop it, right, and to, and to maintain it. Um, so that's that, that's a good point as well. Uh, so, so purchasing equipment then that that is mobile um, might be the might be the best answer, and we and we, we aren't necessarily closing the door on the possibility of someone coming up with uh, some creative solutions for that space. So we have two two different lines of thought. So we have. Uh, buy equipment in hopes of still finding a way to make the gym work and then we have it was a good try and, and uh, putting you know good money after bad um, so we're going to need to get some consensus on that I, is it safe to get consensus that plan a would be for Mr. Knopper to check to see if it could go towards this outdoor gym now so that way it, it's 
$25,000 that we would have more anyway that we could go towards the gym should we figure out that with a rec director starts. So is, is that safe to say for you guys as well? I just look this way, but, but plan A would be to put it into the outdoor. Okay, so plan A we know of, so the question is plan B. So um, either way, plan, uh, whether we buy the equipment or we don't, I think to buy as much resources as we can for um, things that are re relevant to classes, we would do because again, that, that, that's a grant for that. So the question is, uh, I hate to do it this way, but they, they need direction. Everybody knows that we've consistently tried for a couple of years now. So the question is, do you think that we should be buying equipment? Because if we buy equipment, it is a serious commitment to trying to figure that out. You don't wanna buy equipment to put it in a closet. So uh, I'll be looking for just a quick show of hands. How many think that we should be buying the equipment and how many don't? So how many people think that we should be buying the equipment with a grant, uh, $25,000 worth, just a quick show of hands? The, equi sorry, the equipment would be applicable not necessarily to the, out the outdoor exercise part? Sorry, this would be for indoor equipment, yeah. yeah. If, we can't al if we can't allocate it to the outdoor, yeah. plan B would be to buy indoor equipment or plan the other idea is not to buy the equipment at all, and I think at that point it's safe to assume that staff will be having a conversation with us about making that a council chamber. That is my that is my assumption on that space. See, your worship, I, I think in terms of making that a council chamber, it, 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 it's part of our arena, which was originally built as a center of excellence for hockey, and I, I think you know that that is uh, part of. So when you start talking about the, the future of the arena and what the arena could be, um, I'm not sure that the council chamber is necessarily the best spot right there, but uh, um, I think that's a, a larger conversation. And if we, uh, I mean, we could spend $25,000 on portable equipment pretty quickly, and that equipment portably could be ported down to the, uh, to the point for exercise classes and things like that. Um, I, I do think a, a broader discussion about what what potentially should be in the arena beside the medical center? I think it should be something, you know, medical there <laughs> uh, okay. for all intents and purposes. But. Deputy Mayor Akaji. Um thank you, Your Worship and Council. I think that um, I'd like to see the money spent on on equipment, uh, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Um, I'm not an expert in that field, but I think if we could ask someone who would possibly suggest what we could put in there. Um, it doesn't mean that if we do make it into a council chamber that it's permanent council chambers. We've never had a permanent residency yet for a while, so um, I don't think if we move in there that we won't be moving out of there in, in due time. But I would like to see if we have this grant, I'd hate to see it go, but then again, I don't want to see us Wait, not waste the money, but buy something that would be totally irrelevant for exercise class. Um, I myself don't have that expertise, but we have enough people in the community that maybe we could get a committee or somebody, but time's running out, um, and, and our poor staff are <laughs> bouncing back and forth with this, and we've, this isn't just a, an issue we brought up yesterday. We've been trying to find a rec person to do that. Nobody has come forth, and yes, COVID was a, you know, a deterrent at first, but I think now, with things opening up that, you know, perhaps, but again, time is against us. So if we're going to buy the equipment, then we should get some uh, expertise in the, in the purchase of this equipment, and then store it there if, if need be, and hopefully use it for exercise classes or for whatever groups from the youth to the, you know, the seniors group. But um, I think we need, we do need some input from somebody. And if there's anybody that's out there listening and would like to um, give us an input, that might be something that they contact the town staff. But um, I, you know, I think we're gonna lose that money if we don't do something. Thank you, Deputy Thank Mayor. You. I do think that staff does have a detailed list of it as a gym of what we're gonna purchase. The total is about $40,000, is that correct? Through your worship, that's correct. We have three quotes from three different businesses to supply us with equipment for the indoor fitness center. In regards to the outdoor equipment, if we were to purchase, we would probably purchase in partnership with Sorty for outdoor equipment that would meet the needs. So uh, we could look at both options, but uh, the deadline is the 31st. And so it, it really comes down to, without debating, is 
the plan B, because plan A is the outdoor, we could do it. Plan B is do you think we should purchase equipment? And if we're purchasing equipment, again, you should be prepared to fund a gym. It's that simple. There's no one coming in. I know we have a rec director, but this has been two years and a couple people gave it a good look and everybody walked away. They looked at the financial model behind it and they looked at it and they said it's not a good business model. It comes down to that simple. So if we buy the equipment, we should run a gym. If we're not gonna run a gym, don't buy the equipment. It's that simple, because it can't just sit there and it takes your credibility away from getting other grants. So again, if you wanna run a gym, that's what this vote really is. It, it's, it, I know I'm, I'm, I'm jumping us down a lane, but don't buy the equipment if you're not gonna run a gym, because no one wants one. No, no one wants to run one anyway. And I know that that's really harsh comments, but we've tried for two years. Councillor Hurdle. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to, to support what you're saying. You know, um, I, I, I was a big champion of this. I really wanted to see this happen. I would love to see a, 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 a gym in town. Um, and I know I don't speak just for myself, but I think one of the reasons why the town, why we are hedging our bets on, on running a gym is because we know the same reason that, that the people who approach us do, is that we just, we cannot make this a feasible model that is financially reasonable for the community um, uh, without putting an, a, you know, an undue burden financially on, on, on the town. Um, and I just don't think that's, that's fair. Um, and it breaks my heart to say that, because again, I would love to see this here. But if we have, again, plan A, if we have a fitness, facility of some kind outdoor, uh, and we can maybe uh, redirect some of those funds to that, I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, it's not throwing uh, good, good money after bad, as, as uh, Councillor Heenan mentioned, but, and again, to support your comments, Mr. Ma uh, your Worship, I also, uh, you know, we shouldn't go half measures on this, like, right. end up buying a bunch of equipment that just gather dust in a room somewhere, and, uh, you know, just, just because. Uh, I don't think that serves us either. I think we should go 100% in one direction, or not at all. And uh, to your point, Councilor Hurl, not to uh, underestimate how much $25,000 is, but it's actually a small piece of what the overall operation of a gym will cost the taxpayer of St. Andrews. So I'd rather uh, not put us down a lane and have it as part of budget conversation, but we talked earlier about Katie's Cove. Like if we're taking this on, it's all cost, so we have to be strategic as well. So uh, Council, unless someone has anything new to add, I'll get consensus on Plan B if you would like to um, order um, the actual gym equipment a part of the 40,000, or you'd like to focus on uh, exercise equipment that could be portable for classes. Because we're not not gonna apply for anything, we have the funds. There is a list, we could add more to it, I'm sure, uh, Mr. Knopper. Um, but I think that's the direction that staff needs at this point, and we're out of time, so we really do have to make that decision tonight. I know we've been talking about this for a couple of years in this council, pretty much since we got in. So council, uh, how many think that we should buy uh, gym equipment as part of that original $40,000 quote that staff has? Uh, just a quick show of hands. Okay, how many think that Mr. Knopper should uh, change the list to resistance equipment and other things for training classes that he can purchase that could be used by community groups in our community? Your Worship, can, can I just... Uh, absolutely. It, it may be mobile, but it's the same problem. Who's gonna be organizing this stuff to have the classes and stuff? That'd be the only thing I'd put on you. It still runs the same risk that you're going to be packing the stuff in a closet. Like there's no one actively right now that has courses and stuff that is, or sorry, like classes and stuff that do this. Maybe there is, and the, white, or the, white, the physiotherapist would certainly make some use of it, but they'd need the use of that space too to, to, to make it work out, which runs into the same problem that you have somebody letting people in and out just. But we have had a few people come forward that had interest in running classes over the last couple of years, right? Yeah, to a certain extent. Uh, the problem we have that, you know, we have someone who's teaching yoga right now, they've outgrown that space and they actually want to go upstairs that, you know, because you know, um, people, as we noticed, a couple of counselors feel comfortable with their masks tonight. They're still in some of these classes. People still want fairly social distancing, and so they're needing the space. So I think we can make use of the space in the fitness. There will be some classes that go forward. We've had someone inquire about martial art exercise or martial art lessons, and there's different things like that we can probably make work, but it is a different model than we've looked at in the past. But it goes back to if we're buying this resistance equipment, somebody still has to be putting initiatives to use it. Yeah. So, uh, Councillor Hurdle. Sorry not to keep going over this again, but I think it's important to bear in mind that this is a government grant. It's still taxpayer money at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And if we are spending taxpayer money to put a bunch of equipment in a room that nobody uses, 
I don't think that's a good look for us, unfortunately. I agree. So, uh, Councilor, or Councilor Heenan. I'm sorry to keep barging on this, but I believe I would, I would support the motion if we could use the $25,000 in outdoor equipment or add to sortie or whatever, I would fully support it. But the other is far too risky for the town and taxpayers. Thank you. Okay, so you're saying outdoors or nothing, correct? That's, that is okay. correct, Your Worship. Anyone else feel that way as well? Anyone else think that we should just leave it with Mr. Knopper to see what could be used for uh, classes? Uh, um, I, again, I know there's a couple of people that have reached out, like maybe there's stuff that they could say they could use. Meet with a physiotherapist, what could they use? Um, you know, th there, there's probably some opportunity there. I'm not, I don't think it's $25,000, but it, it could be five. <laughs> Your, your Worship, I'll also note if it is resistance bands and stuff like that, perhaps it's something the recreation director can find other teachers to run outdoor classes or, you know, looking at it from other programming standpoints to build off of. It would give them an avenue or something to use to build from. Like the town having 40 yoga mats isn't a bad thing, right? So, like, there, there's, there's little things like that that we can purchase that'll add up. At this point, I don't want to really get into the debate of what those are. I think I will entrust staff uh, to, uh, to talk to partners and find out what they think it will be used. But the message I'm getting from council is don't buy it for the sake of buying it, buy it if we think we can use it, right? So, all right, is that, is that enough consensus from council? <laughs> that was a, a whole new conversation I didn't expect to have tonight, but uh, we did have to make a decision on that. So I think you've got enough council consensus on that now at this point. Um, so <laughs> back to uh, the original, it sounds like we've discussed that one completely. Is that safe to say? <laughs> so at this point, we're going to switch to planning and economic development. Councillor Heenan. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. The first one is PED 220303, amendment to MP 20-05 to municipal plan MP 2001 for rezoning of 258 Montague Street, first reading. The background is the Town of St. Andrews has received a zoning request with Municipal Plan Amendment to, from 258 Montague Street, Benjamin and Zaynib Faulkner Millay, owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PDI 01320894, is seeking a rezoning from service residential to tourist commercial zone to allow for in brackets tea room restaurant that is to open to the general public in addition to existing bed and breakfast. The Planning Review and Adjustment Committee, PRAC, provided temporary use permit in May of 2021 for the owners to test the tea room concept. Public presentation, March 21st, 2022. First reading, public hearing of objections, view of planning advisory committee, second reading, third and final reading. Motion, that council grants leave for the first reading of amendment MP20-05 to the town of St. Andrews Municipal Plan for Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner Malay, owner of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PDI 01320894, to move from residential designation to commercial designation to the generalized future land use map. And your worship, I so move. A seconder for that motion. Councillor Gumashell, discussion. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, Your Worship. That has uh, carried, so we will go to first reading. This is bylaw number MP20-05, a bylaw to amend bylaw number uh, MP20-01, being municipal plan bylaw for the town of St. Andrews, being enacted by the council of the town of St. Andrews as follows. One bylaw number MP20-01, the municipal plan bylaw for the town of St. Andrews, is amended by changing the designation as shown on the generalized future land use map attached to the said bylaw as Schedule A thereof for the land shown on Schedule 1 attached here to and forming part hereof from residential designation to commercial designation. It has been read the first time on March 21st, 2022. 
Next motion. Thank you, Your Worship. That Council requests the views of the Planning Advisory Committee for the Town of St. Andrews as per Section 110 of the Community Planning Act on Amendment MP20-05 to the Town of St. Andrews Municipal Plan MP20-01 for Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner Millay, owner of owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PID 01320894, to move from residential designation to commercial designation to the generalized future land use map, and I so move. And a seconder for that one. We've got Councillor Hurdle, discussion. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That is everybody that has been carried, next motion. Yes, Your Worship, that Council sets the date of Tuesday, April the 19th, 2022 at 6.33, uh, sorry, 6.30 p.m. at the Charlotte County Courthouse for a public hearing of objections as per Section 111 of the Community Planning Act on Amendment MP20-05 to the Town of St. Andrews Municipal Plan for Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner Millay, owner, Owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PID 01320894, to move from residential designation to commercial designation to the generalized futures map, use map. And I so move. And the seconder for that one is Deputy Mayor Akaji. Discussion on that one? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. That is everybody, aye. and that has been carried as well. And uh, we're on to the next motion. Yes, Your Worship and Council, it's PED 220304, Amendment Z1, Z21-09 to Zoning Bylaw Z21-01 for rezoning of 258 Montague Street. The Town of St. Andrews has received a rezoning request from 258 Montague Street to move from service residential to tourist commercial. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Faulkner Millay, owner of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PID 01320894, is seeking a rezoning to allow for a tea room restaurant that is open to the general public in, in addition to existing bed and breakfast. A one-time, or sorry, a one-year temporary use permit was provided by the Planning Regional Adjustments Committee in May of 2021. The rezoning is coinciding with the amendment MP20-05 to the Municipal Plan M. P20-01. Steps that need to be followed include first reading, public hearing of objections, obtain views of PAC, second reading, third and final reading. And the motion that council grants leave for the first reading of amendment Z21-09 to the Town of St. Andrews Zoning Bylaw Z21-01 for Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner Millay, owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PID 01320894 to rezone from service residential to tourist commercial. I so move. Thank you, Councillor Heenan, a seconder. Okay, Councillor Blanchard, discussion? All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, Your Worship. That's everybody, so we will go to first reading. This is bylaw number Z21-09, a bylaw to amend bylaw number Z21-01, being the zoning bylaw for the Town of St. Andrews, being enacted by the Council of the Town of St. Andrews as follows. Number one, that bylaw number Z21-01, the zoning bylaw for the Town of St. Andrews, is amended by changing the zone as shown on the zoning map attached to the said bylaw as Schedule A thereof for the land shown on Schedule 1 attached here to and forming part here of from SR, which is serviced residential zone, to TC, which is tourist commercial zone. It was read a first time, the 21st day of March 2022. Next motion, Your Worship and yes, Council. Please. 
that Council requests views of the Planning Advisory Committee for the Town of St. Andrews as per Section 110 of the Community Planning Act on amendment of Z21-09 to the Town of St. Andrews Zoning Bylaw Z21-01 for Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner Millay, owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast, PID is 01320894 to rezone from service residential to tourist commercial. I so move, Your Worship. And a seconder for that one. We've got Councillor Hurdle. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, Your Worship. So everybody, once again, that has been carried. Okay, the next motion, Your Worship, um, is that Council sets the date of Tuesday, April the 19th, 2022, at 6.30 p.m. at the Charlotte County courthouse for public hearing of objections as per section 111 of the Community Planning Act on amendment Z21-09 to the Town of St. Andrews zoning bylaw Z21-01 for Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Faulkner Malay, owners of 258 Montague Street, the Montague Rose Bed and Breakfast PID 01320894 to rezone from service Residential to tourist commercial. I so move. Seconder for that one. Deputy Mayor Akaji. Discussion? Call the question. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, Your Worship. That has been carried as well. Your Worship, just one quick point. So, Council may realize that both uh, public hearings of objection are being hosted at the exact same time. Speaking with the planners, there was no issue under the Community Planning Act to merge the MP2005 and Z2109. So, it just speeds up the process. So, we're not having two public hearings right in a row. Perfect. Let's do that all the time when we can. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got a question from Councillor Hurdle. Thank you, Your Worship, and sorry. I just, um, uh, we have the five stipulations here in the terms and conditions that be implemented, and have we approached uh, um, uh, Zainab and Ben about these five stipulations, and, and what are their thoughts on them? Uh, through you, Your Worship, I know that the planners, actually this came from the, uh, the building inspector and from the presentation that you received from Planner Gopin tonight, that those will be part of a resolution that'll come forward at third reading, that'll be attached with the zoning, so that at any point if uh, another proponent or they would like changes to it, it can be a simple resolution of council. Perfect. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you. And it'd be good if council had those all obviously prior to the hearing of objections, as that technically is a hearing of objection to what is proposed. So, good question. Uh, we'll move on to the next one, but I believe Councillor Gumichel has declared a conflict, so we'll just give him just one moment mm -hmm. to, uh, to leave the room. I think maybe the second one. <laughs> I don't want you in there. <laughs> you better come back, Councillor Gumichel. <laughs> All right, he's left the room, so let's continue. All right, Your Worship and Council. The next motion is PED 220305, and it is Six Cemetery Road Fence Encroachment on Town Easement Discussion. The Southwest New Brunswick Service Commission has notified the Town of St. Andrews that the owner of Six Cemetery Road, Renata Sorrell, has built a fence on the town right away. The purpose of the fence was to keep deer out of the town, deer deer out and the town has received formal request from the owner for the fence to remain in place. However, the owner did not follow the property building permit process or the zoning bylaw when constructing the fence. Staff is bringing this to the attention of council and we are seeking directions on how to proceed. Council has the following options. Option number one. Request the owner to take down the fence and move it on their property. Option two, that council allows the fence to remain on the town right of way and an agreement is developed noting the following terms and condition. Bullet one, the town has no responsibility for damage caused or hold harmless to the fence on the town right of way. That the fence does not expand, that the height of the fence does not change. If council is in agreement with option two, then the fence does not have to go back to the PAC for variance. If council selects option number one, then it has to go to PAC for a variance. The motion is that Council of Town of St. Andrews makes the following recommendations regarding the fence built 
on the town of town right away at 6 Cemetery Road in St. Andrews, owned by Renata Sorrell. I so move. Perfect. So what we'll have to do is add in which option uh, you pick, uh, unless you have a different one, but I think one and two is uh, the two options that staff have before you. So I, I will open it up just to get some consensus on if you prefer option one or two. Uh, you do have the authority to request that it be taken down, but in the same sense, staff has found a workaround, otherwise they wouldn't have put it for option two. So just to get a quick consensus, how many people are in favor of option one? How many people are in favor of option two? Okay, Councillor Heenan, I'll ask you just to add uh, at the end uh, that uh, that uh, basically uh, the Council of the Town, I'll read it and you can move in a second, that the Council of the Town of St. Anne's makes the following recommendation regarding the fence built on the town right away at 6 Cemetery Road, St. Anne's owned by Renetta Sorrell, that uh, the fence will remain on the town right away and that an agreement is developed noting the following terms and conditions. The town has no responsibility for damage caused or hold harmless to the fence on the town right away, that the fence does not expand, and that the height of the fence does not change. Um, so would you care to move on that particular motion? I will move that. Your A motion. seconder on that motion. Councillor Blanchard. Uh, discussion? Councillor Hurdle. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, obviously, again, this is, this is a difficult one because uh, on one hand, we could be careful about precedent and uh, the ability to build on town land is not something that we want to encourage and um, we need to make it clear that, you know, the general public shouldn't be building things on, on town land. However, I went down to take a look at the fence. Um, it's a nice looking fence and that shouldn't factor into our decision either, but it's there and, and, I, and I don't think it's doing anyone any, any harm. So one of the things I'd like to wonder if it's, it's, it's an amendment possible is that we build in that it's that maintenance of the fence is also maintained regularly so that it keeps up its appearance um, so that it doesn't look deteriorated because it is on town land and we need to make sure that the owners are taking care of the fence properly. I think we could call that a friendly amendment if you're okay with it and just add it. For, can you just add it in? Does that work for everybody versus go through the formal? That's yes. I can go the long way if you'd prefer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thank you for that, Councilor Hurdle. Anyone else? Okay, then I will call the question. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, or That is everybody, so that has been carried, and we'll let Councilor Gumichel return if he wishes. I think he's coming back. All right, so that wraps up uh, motions for this evening. Uh, there is nothing under new business, so we are at question period. Mr. Knopper, has anything come forward for council's attention at this point? Uh, through your worship, I have received no email correspondence uh, through the public. Uh, we do have four people on, or two people on. Nope. One person on? No. No, there will be no questions from there. I will note that there is a lively discussion on our audio uh, settings on Facebook, so uh, please bear with us. We will try to maintain that and get it better for next time. Okay, sounds good. People are, are used to the Zoom crystal clear. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. So thanks, everyone, for their patience this evening. Um, all right, at this point, then, any uh, comment by any member of council? Okay, uh, Councillor Heenan. I just got to applaud the town staff for, um, for doing all this work on all of these projects and finding out all the options. Uh, by me, it's so appreciated, and I'm sure the rest of council feels the same way. Thank you. We certainly do. Thank you, Councillor Heenan. Anyone else? I think I'm good this, for this meeting. All right. Uh, so at this point, I will be looking uh, at... 8.34 p.m., Council move into closed session per the Local Governance Act, Section 681C, information that could cause financial loss or gain to a person or the local government or could jeopardize negotiations leading to an agreement or contract, and Section 681D, the proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land. Looking for a mover. I've got Councillor Heenan and seconded by Councillor Hurdle. Any discussion on going to close? All in favor of going to close, please signify by saying aye. That is everybody. We're in closed session. We'll just give a few minutes before we begin while we transition.